Buenas noches a todos. All right, learning some Spanish. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Qué pasa? <laughs> to hear Gordy speak Spanish is, is really something, you know? It's a great treat. <laughs> Esta noche les quiero invitar a todos ustedes, amigos de la villita, que vengan a mi cuarto después de esta reunión, si tienen dinero. Pero no si tienen un poquito de dinero, si tienen mucho dinero. Vengan a mi cuarto todos los amigos de la villita. Man, I'm learning from John Perkins, I tell you. And if you don't understand what I said, well, you know, learn some Spanish. <laughs> One of the most familiar passages that uh, we have heard and we are, have been instructed by and taught in CCDA is the passage in John chapter 4 about the Samaritan woman. This person that, that had no possibility of having an experience with God, who was locked out of relationship with God, who was on the outside, who was judged and, and who herself became a victim of a lifestyle that kept her from really having fellowship with God. And Jesus, on his, on his travels, instead of going around Samaria, he said, you know what, we're going to go through Samaria because there's something there that I got to do. And he brought his disciples and he brought them along with him and they stopped and he's uh, there at this well and he says, you know what, I got to rest here for a while. And they go off and uh, they go to find food and while they're gone trying to feed their stomachs and while they're gone trying to satisfy their needs, Jesus has one of the most incredible encounters with anyone that's recorded in history. And he meets this woman and he begins to minister and love her and, and reveal to her that he is the Messiah, the one true uh, Savior that was sent by God to bring life to the world. And he reveals to her that, that, that she herself can have that life even though she was a sinner. Even though her lifestyle and, and others, she was a sinner, but she was also a person who had been sinned against. And Jesus Christ touches her life, and an incredible thing happens, and, and, and ministry takes place. Not unlike the kind of ministry that you and I want to see happen in our communities. Jesus the Reconciler. And then when the disciples come back, they come in and, and it says in the meantime they come and they, and they find Jesus and they're oblivious to what just happened. And he said, they say to him, teacher, teacher, have something to eat. But he answered to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Les dice, yo tengo algo que comer que ustedes no conocen. You don't know nothing about this food. And so the disciples started asking among themselves, well, you know, who, who, who brought him the Taco Bell? <laughs> you know, who brought him the food? Where did he get food? Why isn't he hungry? And then Jesus makes one of the most incredible statements in the Bible and one that has fed my soul. He says, my food, he said, is to obey the will of the one who sent me and to finish what he gave me to do, to finish the work that he gave me to do. Mi comida es hacer la voluntad del que me envió y terminar su trabajo. Well, I want to tell you that tonight that that is what has filled my heart, that I believe that the reason that we're here and the reason that I'm here today is because one day Jesus came into my life and he began to tear away all other distractions, all other priorities to where I too could say like Jesus, my food is to do the will of he who sent me and to accomplish that work 
that he sent me to do. Mi comida, what I need to live and to be sustained, the thing that drives me, the thing that gives me purpose, the thing that, that makes me who I am. It ain't food, even though I love food. But it's to do the will of my Father. I, 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 that's, there's nothing I want more. And they didn't understand. The disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. But tonight I want to talk to you a little bit about how our hearts can be gripped with the same response that Jesus himself responded with. That I believe that's what God wants to strip us to in our life. I believe that's what we've been hearing uh, people exhort us to, that in the issues of reconciliation, in the issues of, of doing the will of God and not just talking about it, that we would be able to say, my food, what, what, what makes me full, what makes me who I, I am is the, the fact of doing the will of he who sent me and then finishing the work that he has sent me to do. Well, let me tell you what my food is tonight. I believe that God has laid on my heart a desire, number one, to be a man of God, to be a man of character, to be a man after God's own heart. And you know what that means? You know what God is doing to me? God is breaking me. God is tearing me apart. God is revealing to me how sinful I am. That I can't be who he wants me to be in my own power. That I can't meet people's expectations. That I can't do the things that, that I know need to be done. And so as I strip all of that away, I scream and I yell in my heart the same thing that King David said in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing more I need. What shall I want? There's nothing else. There's nothing else. The Lord is my shepherd. My call. And I believe your call as a Christian. The very first thing we need to, to, to get straight is that God wants to make us pure. Men and women of character that love God more than anything else. And then for me. I thank God that he has revealed to me the purpose the, the, that, that I, I can say, this is the job. This is the task that God has called me to. And that is to, to pastor this little church in southwest Chicago in the barrio of La Villita, to, to work there, to live there, to embrace my brothers and sisters there, to be a shepherd and to love and, and, and to raise up Men and women of God who have that same burden to say, mi comida es hacer la voluntad de Dios. And, and, and that's what God has laid on my heart to do. And then, and then in his mercy and, and, and by his spirit to be able to encourage and to move and to challenge other brothers and sisters to do the same kind of thing, to, to embrace barrios all over this country, all over Latin America, to take the principles of Christian community development and to begin doing the same thing because I believe that in this we have a strategy, we have a tool, we have a biblical approach to bringing transformation to barrios and to communities all over our country that we, I have not found in anything else. I praise God for what he's done in this movement and the way that he has put that on my heart. And let, let me tell you a little bit about the people that God has called me to reach and the people that, that I believe that all of us need to be aware of and know that, 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 you know, to love God is to love the Latino people. Some of you have seen the movie El Norte. It's a movie about a family and, and a people that come to El Norte, to the north from, from uh, Guatemala, from Latin America. And it, 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 it chronicles their journey into Los Angeles, to the north. And you know what happens in this movie? You would not believe the, 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 the atrocities that they have to face as they make their way from a, a life of poverty into this country, believing that when they get to the north, that they're going to have prosperity and riches and freedom and hope. But when they get to El Norte, you know what they find? They find a country where they are strangers. 
even though the Spanish language is plastered all over their streets and all over their freeways, they are aliens and they are unwanted and they are unwelcome. And as we see in this movie, they struggled and they worked and, and, and they just could not understand why they could not reach the American dream. And they don't even know what the American dream is because it's out of reach. They get closer and closer only to find out that they're further away. And many of our peoples have come to this country seeking this myth, this myth, this dream that this is not to be found. And they come and they, they search and they work and, and, and they don't find it because they struggle and, and, and they're uh, strangers in a land that is somewhat familiar. And then there's another movie that some of you have seen. It's called American Me. And it's a story of, of, of these young uh, uh, gangbangers and, and, and gang members and, that are in uh, the barrios of Los Angeles and how their whole life is uh, wrapped up in violence and the, and the fellowship of the club of these gangs. And they are trapped in this lifestyle. They don't know how to function outside of the criminal, criminal justice system. They don't know how to function outside of the gang. No saben cómo vivir en este mundo. They don't know how to live in this world except for in those conditions. They are isolated. They're isolated. Well, that, it's not just a movie, friends. We have many of our young people who as they are struggling with understanding what it means to be Chicano, a, a Mexican descent or Latino descent, and then living in an Anglo culture where, that is uh, unfamiliar and, and many times antagonistic, they are caught in the middle and they can't even speak to their own parents. They come home and they speak English and their parents respond to them in Espanol. And there's a clash and there's generational gap that tears these kids apart. And I thank God for, for the, the way that God has moved in the life of Bob uh, Salinas in our church who's beginning to raise up these young men and reaching out to them in the name of Jesus and, and making a difference in the life of Caesar, in the life of Jesse and Ernie and Israel. Now, all these biblical names, I'm trying to get Ernie to change his name. If we do that, boy, we'll have something, right? And I'm excited because we know that even though the picture is bleak that is painted in this movie, that there's a new reality, there's a new hope that is only able to be realized through the gospel. And then there's that movie, Stand and Deliver. One of my heroes is Jaime Escalante, this teacher, this math teacher, this trigonometry teacher in East L.A. again. And he comes, and he comes with a message of hope, a message of expectation, and he takes these barrio kids that nobody else gave a rip about, nobody gave a chance, and he said, Sabes que? you can be somebody. You can excel, you can learn math, you can, you can do it. And I love when he tells his students, Johnny, come on, you can do it, Johnny. Don't give up. And then one day, he tells the story of a man, of, 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 of uh, uh, one of his classrooms when he has two students, both of them named Johnny. And one day they have an open house, and one of the Johnnies is a brilliant student, all kinds of potential. And then the other student, Johnny, is barely getting by. He never comes to class. He's struggling. He, he doesn't know if he's going to make it. And so the night of open house, Johnny's mother comes, and she comes into the door, the, the classroom door, and she begins talking to the teacher, the Jaime, and then he begins to say, oh, I can't, but one can't tell you how great your son Johnny is. Es un estudiante fabuloso, es increíble. And she, he goes on and tells her how great he is. And the, and the mother is about to drop dead. She can't believe it. And she just is wide-eyed and she leaves home all excited. The next day, the Johnny who was always late, never came to class, walks in. He's the first one there. He goes and he sits down at the front of the classroom. And he goes up with a kind of terror in his heart and shy. And he goes up to Jaime and he says, I want to thank you for all the great things you told my grandmother about me last night. 
And he said, man, from that day on, Johnny was the best student I had in class because we know that people rise to the level of expectation. And then there's the movie Mi Familia. And in this movie Mi Familia, it's a Mexican family that, 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 that is struggling to, you know, try to figure out who they are again in this country. And one of the scenes that is incredible is when one of the sons who goes to college, he, he, get, he learns how to wear a tie, and, he, and, and, and he's like the Garcia sisters who lost their accent. It's the name of a book. He worked hard to lose his accent. He worked hard to get educated. He worked hard to fit into the culture. And then he comes home, and he brings his, his mujer, his, his vieja, if you're a Mexican, you know. He brings his fiance to meet his new, her, her new parents-in-law. And she happens to be white. And so he is so nervous because he knows that the rest of his family is going to embarrass him and, and his, his fiance in front of her parents that came in in their Mercedes and all of this. And he's begging them, please, don't embarrass me. Don't do anything to embarrass me. And it's a, a, an uncomfortable scene. And they come in, they don't know what to say to each other. They, they haven't taken Raleigh and, Gil, and Glenn's class on reconciliation. They haven't read Chris's and Spencer's books. They haven't made no offering to John. <laughs> and as soon as they come in, one of the, the small Alec older brothers, he says, ¿Sabes qué? Déjame decirte, mi abuelito está enterado allá en el backyard. He says, you know, did, 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 uh, did my brother tell you that our grandfather's buried in the backyard? <laughs> now, that broke the ice. <laughs> you see, for many of us, the only experience we have with Latino brothers and sisters is what we see in the movies. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I thought that I was going to have to grow up like Ricky Ricardo and just play the bongos and sing <laughs> Baba Lou. <laughs> but I thank God that my food is to do the will of my Father. My food is to accomplish the work that He has called me to do. And God is raising up a new generation of leaders Latino and black and all kinds of other cultures, but I want to talk about the Latino brothers today and sisters because our bodies need men and women of God who come and who bring this passion and this commitment and this desire to work and to give themselves to the most important work there is, serving God and raising up His kingdom. And the only way to bring life is through death. Let me tell you, who, I mean, I want, to, I want to tell my wife this today. When I die, this is how I want to be buried. When Cesar Chavez, the leader of the labor movement, right, the UAW, when he died, I remember turning on the television set, and I see thousands and thousands of people, and they're carrying this, this martyr, this hero, the, the, this, this champion for the cause of the farm worker and farm labor. And he is being carried in a casket that's made out of common, plain pine wood. He died living the life. That he died the way he lived, giving of himself to serve his pueblo, to serve his gente. And you know what I want to tell you tonight? that this idea of going into the barrio and doing CCD, of bringing transformation, you know what it's like? It's, it's really like making great salsa. And I want to challenge my brothers and sisters and maybe some of you to commit yourself to make some great salsa in the barrio. To make some great salsa in the barrio. Now, this is what it takes to make great salsa. First, you got to have onions. 
and you got to get, you know, and you chop them all up and you make it all and you, you just get those onions just right. And then you go and you got to have cilantro. You know what cilantro is, right? You get that and it smells good and, and after you do the onions, it takes away that onion smell and you chop up that cilantro and, and you put that in there right with the onions. And then you get the, the chiles. Now tonight, a bunch of all of the people from La Vita, we went to a Chinese restaurant, and, and one of the guys pulled out this big jalapeno pepper. And I said, man, it's good to be home. And so we take those chiles, the jalapenos, and all the other, and we chop them up real spicy because we want to get a good kick when we put it on that food. It don't matter what it is, spaghetti, Chinese food, don't matter. So you get those chiles and you put them in there. And then you put in that salt and pepper. And, and, you, and you spice it up. And then the last ingredient that you put in is you, you get those big, ripe, juicy tomatoes. And you chop them all up and, and you just make, and then you just stir it in and you let it sit for a while. And man, you'd go down and you get those Frito-Lays or the Doritos or whatever and you just go at it. And, and, and you, 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 the, the flavor and the spice and everything is great. Making great salsa in the barrio. And CCDA is a, light, is a lot like that. All kinds of elements, all kinds of ingredients that come together to make great salsa in the barrio. Well, last Christmas, I decided to get a little muppified and a little, uh, you know, happy, and I uh, was going to make, I found a recipe for salsa. And here's what I did. I put all the right ingredients, but then I got to the point where, where you know, where, where to complete it off, and, and instead of tomatoes, you know what this recipe called for? It called for pineapple and cranberries. So I make it all up, and I put that in, I leave out, and I take this, this holiday salsa to my church, to a potluck. <laughs> and I put it there, and everybody knows that el pastor is el que hizo esta salsa. <laughs> and, and one by one, they come, and they look, and they check it out, and they're trying to figure out what it is. <laughs> and then one of my... You know, homies comes up to me, this old Mexican man in my church, and he me dice, Pastor, ¿sabes qué? No puedes hacer salsa <laughs> sin los tomates. He says, you can't make authentic salsa without the tomatoes. It took one of my church members to remind me. He said that that's not real salsa. You can't make real salsa without the tomatoes. And I want to tell you tonight that... That, that, that for CCDA, that Jesus Christ, that the, the church, that's the tomatoes that allows us to make great salsa in the barrio. That you, it doesn't matter if you do housing. It doesn't matter if you build all kinds of apartments. It doesn't matter if you do youth work and leadership development. If you, if you, if you make salsa without the tomatoes, that ain't real salsa. Don't matter if you're bringing education and programs and computers into your church, but if you leave out the tomatoes, it ain't real salsa. It don't matter if you begin to do organizing and you're on the cutting edge and you're bringing all kinds of people and hearing their voice, but if you don't give them Jesus Christ, you're leaving out the tomatoes. Doesn't matter if you're doing economic development and starting pizza parlors in the barrio. Doesn't matter if you're bringing businesses and economic development and doing all kinds of great things. But if you leave out the tomatoes, it's not real salsa. It doesn't matter, folks, what we do. It doesn't matter how creative we are. We, sometimes we get too cute for ourselves. We know what works. We know what's right. We know that Jesus and the church needs to be in the center of everything we do. Now let me tell you what I believe we need to just think about a little bit. I believe that we need to, as we talk about, recon about relocation, we also need to talk about radical Christian community together, where we're loving one another, where we're living together, where we are becoming an authentic 
community of brothers and sisters for Christ. It's not enough that we live in the community. It's not enough that we're just there physically, that we're just there on that block. But we need to become one. We need to become familia. And that is a concept that in the barrio is important. It don't matter all the great things you do. It don't matter. You have to be familia. And so as you do church and as you talk about reconciliation, don't forget the tomatoes. Because without the tomatoes, it ain't real salsa. And then as you talk about reconciliation, talk about how to come together. You know, we have this incredible challenge as Latinos because not only do we need to be reconciled to our white brothers and sisters, but we need to be reconciled first generation, recent arrivals, to second and third generation where we call each other names, we look at each other with mistrust, where we don't, we're not reconciled, we're not one. And God needs to, uh, to, to put that at the forefront of what we do. Because if we don't do that, it's like making salsa without the tomatoes. And we need to be reconciled one Latino culture to another. Because we're not all alike. There are many Latino cultures. There are many countries. And together we are trying to understand what it means to be the reconciled aisle people of God. And redistribution. We have a lot to learn to in this process of redistribution. Because one of the struggles that we, ha we have as we have people coming and living in our community is, you know what, I want to be real honest with you, that even though we're in the same community, we don't live at the same level. We have discrepancies, and, and people see it, and it hurts our witness. We need to understand what Paul and Jesus said, that when, when uh, one is in need, that the other has to come and provide out of their abundance. What does it mean to, be, uh, uh, to, to practice redistribution in the barrio? We cannot really do redistribution if we leave out the tomatoes. And then in this great passage, after Jesus tells his disciples what his food, what his purpose was. Look at what he says. He says, you have a saying. Four more months and then the harvest. But I tell you, take a good look at the fields. The crops are now ripe and ready to be harvested. And my friends, what I want to close with tonight is I want to tell you that all over this country are... Latino communities, our barrios are ripe and they're ready for the harvest. And God wants to be, it wants to raise up people to take up the challenge of going to the barrio and making great salsa. In Philadelphia, he wants to challenge you to go to North Philly and to make great salsa in the barrio. In Los Angeles, he wants to challenge you to continue to go into those communities of East L.A. and Whittier and Compton and Pico Rivera and to go with the commitment of making great salsa in the barrio. In Chicago and Humboldt Park, he wants you to take this message and he wants you to go and he wants you to make great salsa in the barrio. In Washington and Oregon where the Latinos are hidden away, and, and you got to go out and find him. He wants you to go, and he wants you to make great salsa in the barrio. He wants you to go in Arizona and Phoenix and Tempe and in, in all those different southwestern cities, and he wants you to make great salsa in the barrio. In Dallas, in West Laco, you know where that is? Southern Texas? No amen? <laughs> Not even one? He's calling the people to go and to make great salsa in the barrio in the dominican republic god is calling brothers and sisters like roberto to go out and to make great salsa in the barrio you, my friends we have a great opportunity to make great salsa for the glory of god to make great salsa for the glory of, of his kingdom but wherever you are and wherever you're doing ministry let me ask you not to do one thing. I want to ask you not to leave out the tomatoes. 
My will, says Jesus, is to do the will of he who sent me and to accomplish the work that he called me to do. May God grant us the grace to take up the challenge to go out and make great salsa in the barrio. Amen.